Hello, everybody from all over the world. It's so great to see. Um, we literally are having people dial in from all over the world. This is fantastic. Um, we have a popular guest today, um, but I'm Beth Johnston, the Chief Community Engagement Officer here at the FSHD Society. And together here today with my colleague, Ms. June Kinoshita, she's our Senior Director of Research and Education. We'd like to welcome you to today's FSHD University webinar. Um, for those of you who don't know us, the FSHD Society is the world's largest research-focused patient advocacy organization that is focused solely on FSHD. We have over 30 volunteer-led chapters across the U.S. and now in Canada. We are part of the 20-plus country World FSHD Alliance, and our mission is to find treatments and a cure for FSHD while empowering our families. So we offer these free FSHD university webinars and so many other great educational events um, to both educate and empower everyone that is affected by FSHD to become their most own best advocate. So today, we are so fortunate to have with us Dr. Jeff Statland from the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, he's going to give us an update on drug development for FSHD. And I don't know, June, would you like to say anything else or properly introduce Dr. Statland? Oh, uh, well, Dr. Statland is... Uh sits at what I call the epicenter of FSHD uh, Drug Development Universe. Uh, he is the uh, co-principal investigator or co-director with Dr. Robbie Tawil of the FSHD Clinical Trial Research Network. And uh, this network uh, started back in 2016. And before that, there were several years of meetings um, to discuss the need for this what network and what it would look like. Um, but uh, Dr. Statlin has been really instrumental in designing and launching this. And we've worked closely, walked side by side along this process. So, um, uh, and it's an, a, Dr. Statlin is a, are you a full, you're a full professor now. Professor. <laughs> yeah. We've watched you like work your way up that academic ladder and uh, at the, at uh, the University of Kansas Medical Center. He is a neurologist um, and he sees many patients with FSHD as well as many other neuromuscular disorders. And you won't believe, uh, I don't think anyone wants to look at his schedule because he's also involved with clinical trials and other conditions, ALS and um, uh, I don't know. What else? Ling, are you doing limb girdle and myotonic? And myotonic dystrophy and... Um... Inherited diseases. <laughs> it makes my head spin. I don't know how. You... <laughs> but when he is with us, you feel like he's fully focused for on FSHD. He's he's done so many things for our community. So anyway, um, uh, and he has been very instrumental in helping to design uh, clinical outcomes and set up the infrastructure to be able to do what is now the largest natural history study for FSHD and also for the clinical trials that we're going to see, be seeing more and more of. So with that, I will turn over the floor to Dr. Statlin. You can share your slides. Okay. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Um, well, I want to thank the FSHD Society for inviting me to speak to you about drug development. Um, I think some of you may recognize this photograph that I have on the screen here. This is a photograph of immigrants on Ellis Island. They're looking out at New York City, which was the brave new world at the time. You can see they have sort of their whole lives, their history packed in bags at their feet. And they're looking out on a world that was really a new world of opportunity, but also a world of challenges. In much the same way, we in the FSHD community now, we're also looking out on a brave new world, but the brave new world now is these new gene-targeted therapies. We have everything we know packed in bags at our feet, what we know about FSHD, and we're looking out at a time that's going to be a time of great opportunity, but also a time of challenges. And I think this is a good metaphor for drug development, but with one key exception. Drug development is really, it's a process, not really a destination. And so what I'm going to talk about today 
is the process, where we're at, and some of the, the key clinical trials that are gonna be coming up in the next year. These are my disclosures. I do have to say I am a consultant for a number of the companies that I'll be talking about today. The information that I'm sharing with you here though is public information. So it's available on clinicaltrials.gov or on the website for these different companies. This is just an overview of what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of where we're at now, about drug studies, some of the language that we use. We'll take a look at our current landscape of the trials that are either uh, happening now or in the near future. And I'll spend particular time on each of the three clinical trials that are likely to occur within the next uh, you know, year from now. And then I'll finish up hopefully with time for us to have questions and answer and discussion about anything that, that people would like to talk about. So we've really seen a revolution in treatment. If I think back to 2010 here at the University of Kansas, we had about 20 clinical trials in neuromuscular diseases, and we had really no FDA approved therapies. Now in 2022, we have over 70 active neuromuscular studies just at my center. And many of these molecular, molecular targeted therapies, they really might sound like science fiction, things like enzyme replacement therapy, gene therapy, gene editing, RNA targeted therapies, splice modulators, stem cells, but they're not science fiction anymore because this list here, this is a list of new drugs that the FDA has approved just in the last eight years. And the ones in red, these are examples of drugs that are using those new gene-targeted therapies. When we think about where are we at for FSHD, we're really ready for that translation to be occurring. Publication of the Unified Model for FSHD in 2010 identified DUX4 as a target for therapy, and this really galvanized the field. It was full, followed by a real rapid pace of development. There were researchers developing cell lines for drug screening, a number of different animal models, both for drug screening and to help us learn about FSHD, several labs developing new therapeutic strategies or drugs that are ready now to go into that translational process and this really was the result of several collaborations, both on the international level, but also between academics, industry, our advocacy partners, and people with FSHD. And you've probably heard this idea, translation from bench to bedside, or the newer term they're using, lab to life. It sounds very directional, right? Like you're going to get there at the end of it. But I want to emphasize, and I started to talk about it in that first slide, that this is really a process that we need to be prepared for. Because it's not like we have a clinical trial and then we're done. We have a clinical trial, it often raises new questions, or there'll be new avenues for research, and we cycle back into the bench or the lab and we have to investigate them, and that helps propel the next set of clinical trials. And what we want to support is a healthy clinical trial drug development process. When we think about types of studies or classes of drugs, we have two types of study, observational study and interventional studies. Observational studies, it's really measuring or understanding the disease as it naturally occurs. In an interventional study, we're going to do something specific to change the course of that disease. It can be a drug, but it also can be a behavioral intervention like exercise or cognitive behavioral therapy. And when we think about drugs, there's several different kinds. They can be investigational drugs. They can be drugs that we're repurposing. When we think about the classes of drugs, the traditional one we think about are small molecules. This is what most of you probably know about. These would be things like your diabetes medicine, your cholesterol medicine, Tylenol, RNA-based therapies, and you may be familiar with these. These have sort of revolutionized treatments for diseases like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, 
or spinal muscular atrophy. And then certainly there's several companies now very close to doing their first in human studies in FSHD with RNA-based therapies. Gene therapy itself, which can be gene replacement, or it can be gene editing or the using a viral vector to deliver an RNA-based drug. And then cell therapies that I think of as regenerative, these are things like stem cells, and we'll talk a little more about it. But what do we want in FSHD? We want to see that we're seeing all kinds of studies going on, and I think we are. And we really like to see that there's development going on in each of these classes of drugs because it raises the possibility for a very robust drug pipeline. And I think we're starting to see that in FSHD. So I do have to say a little something about the genetics of FSHD, and I'm going to grossly oversimplify here. <laughs> no. FSHD, in a nutshell, is it's caused by a gene, DUX4. It's normally turned off, and it's getting turned on. The product of that gene, DUX4, the transcription factor, is toxic to muscle cells. It goes on and it actually activates many hundreds of genes that in the adult muscle tissue causes damage. This is a picture from a biopsy from a patient. The green color is a myotube. Those blue circles are the myonuclei or the control centers of the cell. And that pink color is that duct four protein. Here I'm showing you a cartoon illustration of this a uh, pathological pathway here. And what you can see is it starts at the genetic level with decreased methylation opening up of the chromosome, then transcription of that duct 4 uh, mRNA that's going to then be made into a protein, and then we'll have those downstream effects. And on the left, I've talked about the molecular event that's occurring at each of those stages. And on the right, I'm giving you several classes of drugs that are already in existence that could be uh, approaching FSHD at any of those stages. And notice it's including all of those classes of drugs we talked about. But there are also another group of drugs that may be equally important for FSHD, but aren't disease specific. These would be drugs that might have a beneficial effect, but not be specific to this pathway. And we really want all of these being developed. Many of you have probably seen this picture. This is a picture of the classic pathway of a molecule from development in the lab until approval and marketed by the FDA. And if you look at this, there's a tremendous amount that's going on on the left side of this figure. This is all happening before we even get into people. We start with really an infinite number of possibilities of different drugs, different chemicals that might be important. Then in the preclinical space, the lab, we're going to narrow that down. We're going to use our tools, our cell models, our animal models to help pick one that we think will be important for FSHD. And then a tremendous amount of safety testing is going to go on before they're going to allow us to enter those first in human studies. The human part of the clinical trial is this middle part, and you've probably heard about these phases, phase one, two, and three studies. Simply put together, what they're meant to do is test the safety of the drug, the dosing, whether it meets its target and has an effect, and ultimately, whether it's helpful for people with FSHD. In general, in early phase studies, we're asking questions about safety and dosing. These are often smaller studies, shorter studies. They may have lots of assessments though. Then as we get a little farther along, we're asking bigger questions. We're wanting to know, is the drug doing what it's supposed to do? And is it starting to help people? Those are the phase two and the phase three studies. These are getting larger, larger numbers of subjects and longer in time. They take longer to complete. But the process isn't even really done once you get through those phases, because once a drug hits the market, you then have what's called post-marketing surveillance. And this is where we're really learning 
about how that drug's going to really work in a large population of people with FSHD. This is a snapshot of our current drug development landscape. I took the image on the right off the FSHD Society webpage, and I'm just thrilled that we have this because a few years ago, it was very hard to make a figure like this. Across the top, you can see just that illustration of the pathway through the FDA process. And then down here are all the different companies with programs showing you about where they're at in that process. And notice in the brown, you have uh, traditional small molecule drugs. In the blue, they have more molecular targeted drugs listed here. And on the left side of the screen, I'm showing you active trials on the registry, clinicaltrials.gov. And if you look on the industry side, well, Fulcrum has a phase two study that's still active. It has people in their open label extension. Their phase three study is just starting now. It's called REACH. And so they're recruiting patients uh, at this time. We have another company, Roche, who has an anti-myostatin drug that's going to enter into a phase two study. Really, in the next few months, probably, they'll be opening up. And on the academic side, we have several what would be called observational studies that are meant to work hand in hand with these clinical trials to fill in the gaps of the information that we still need to know. If we look here in the blue, and these are those molecularly targeted therapies, we have one company, Avidity, who've already gone to the FDA and got approval for their first in-human study. So we'll have our first in-human genetically targeted therapy clinical trial likely starting by the end of the year or early in 2023. So I do think it's an exciting time. Uh, in FSHD. Before we get on to talk about those specific studies, just a backup, a step to a few slides just talking about language. Um, outcome measures, when we're thinking about clinical trials, these are simply tools. They're the tools we use in, inter in clinical trials to tell the difference between one point in time and another. It can be used in a clinical trial, but they could also be used in clinic in theory. And ideally, we want these tools to be pertinent to FSHD, to be reliable. What we measure one day, we measure the same thing the next, assuming nothing's changed. We want them to also, though, be sensitive. So what does that mean? It means if something does change in the disease, we want the value in that outcome measure to also change in a proportional way. Ideally, we want them to be inexpensive and we want them to be feasible to collect at multiple sites because FSHD is a rare disease. We likely are going to need multiple sites working together to run these clinical trials. We match the tools to the phase of the study. So in early phase studies, where we're talking about safety or, or dosing or whether that drug's just doing what it's supposed to do, we often rely on things called biomarkers. This can be biological fluids, your blood, it could be your muscles. It also could be something a little more physiological, your blood pressure. It could be neuroimaging of your muscles. Then we have strength and functional measures. We typically start seeing these gain more importance as we go into the phase two or phase three studies where we're now asking that bigger question, is it actually going to help people with FSHD? And then we have things that you report, patient reports of either your quality of life or the physical impact or psychological impact of the disease. And this, again, helps bolster the argument that a drug's doing something beneficial for people. The inclusion and exclusion criteria, and I get the most confusion and the most questions in a way about this concept. Um, it's from the simplest point of view to think about this is probably it's just a set of rules that determines who can enroll in a study. It has a very key role though in how we interpret studies because it determines something we call our external validity. 
So it's how close is the population in our study to a general population of people who have FSHD? We want to be able to say that it's representative, but early in the process of drug development, those criteria are often much more narrow than that. They're often looking for a smaller age range. They may be looking for people who are healthy and have no other medical conditions, and they may select for people who are in a particular state of evolution in terms of where their strength or their function is at. As the trials move on and they get a little closer to asking that question, are they helping people? They tend to broaden those criteria a little bit because now they're wanting to more closely match a general population of people with FSHD. And this is important to know about because the inclusion criteria for your studies can potentially determine what an, uh, a regulatory agency like the FDA, or if you're in Europe, the EMA, is going to put on the drug label. But what, one thing I'd say in the rare neuromuscular diseases and in the inherited diseases so far, they've typically, if they've approved a drug, they've generally approved it for the disease, not for a limited group of people in that disease. But I'd say the insurance companies have not been quite so liberal about it. They've often looked at the inclusion criteria and put up restrictions about who they'll reimburse the cost for. This is a subject probably for a different talk though than this one. But I'd say as the general concept of inclusion criteria, what we usually say is we're going to assume if we see a benefit in this more narrow group defined by the inclusion criteria that we can then, as long as the drug's doing what it's supposed to do, we can broaden this to apply to a general population. I now wanna switch gears and talk about some of the clinical trials that are happening now. And let's start with Fulcrum because they have the active studies going on right now and they're, they're certainly the farthest along in the process. So their drug is lasmopamod. What is it? It's a small molecule. It's repurposed because it was originally investigated for a different kind of condition, a rheumatological condition. It's a P38 inhibitor. This is a class of enzyme that actually has broad effects in the cell. A lot of them are sort of immunomodulatory, but it turns out that in cell models of FSHD, this drug inhibited the production of DUX4, and you see that illustrated here. These are just different doses of lasmopamod. These are DUX4 or three of its downstream targets, and you can just see that if you give the drug, you're getting lower and lower levels of that because it's inhibiting it. On the right side, these are uh, proteins and enzymes that have a role in muscle regeneration and health, and you don't want to see those inhibited. So this is what you would want to see, inhibiting DUX4, not inhibiting other measures of muscle growth. What have they done? Well, Fulcrum have run phase zero to phase two studies. A phase zero study is just a natural history study to help make the tools we're gonna to use in clinical trials. In their phase one study, they demonstrated that they had appropriate safety. So the safety they had seen in the drug when it was used for other diseases, they confirmed the dosing and they showed that they were able to get that drug inside the muscle and it was having an effect in the muscle. In their phase two study, their primary readout was a muscle biomarker. They were unable to show an effect in patient muscle in that clinical trial. So they didn't show what they originally hoped to show, which was that they were going to reduce DUX4. But what they did show were some benefits across a number of different measures in different areas of the body. For example, they thought people who got the drug stabilized how far they could reach with their arms 
whereas people who had placebo lost about two to four percent of the area and space they could reach towards. You can see that illustrated here. On MRI, they thought they saw a stabilization of the fatty infiltration of key muscles, whereas patients who were on placebo showed evolution, uh, an increase in fat in those muscles. And you can see that illustrated in this small figure. And then patient reported a global impression of change. How well do you think you're doing? The people in the placebo group usually said they either were the same or slightly worse, whereas the people who were getting less mopamod felt they were either the same or slightly better. And so you could see these modest effects. I think we owe fulcrum, though, a debt of gratitude as a field because they took several new things that had really not been measured in FSHD, and they took it out and they showed how to operationalize it and use it in a clinical trial. This includes whole body MRI and includes the reachable workspace and includes the muscle biomarker. And these are all likely going to be important in our future studies. But this is an example of a phase two study now making us as a research community have to go back and probably collect more information so we can support the next round of drug development. Where are they at now? Well, they're at their phase three study. This is our first ever phase three study in FSHD. We've never had one before. Um, this study's primary outcome is something functional as it should be in a phase three study. So it's the reachable workspace, how far you can reach in this space around yourself. Secondary measures include the MRI as a measure of muscle structure, as well as patient reported impact of the disease. It is a placebo controlled study. So half people will get the drug, half the people will get a placebo. We won't know who's who. It'll last for 48 weeks, and they're going to include 230 people, which while not a large number for a clinical trial and a common disease, is a large number for a study in a rare disease. When we look at their inclusion criteria, who are they including? Well, adults, they have to have a genetic confirmation of FSHD, but it can be type one or type two. They're using a clinical severity scale to kind of screen the population. I put the scale up here on the right because I figure some of you probably aren't familiar with it. It ranges from zero unaffected to five requiring a wheelchair to move around. And it has this assumption that as you go up in the numbers, more of your lower extremity muscles are going to be affected. So if we look at who they're looking for, they're looking for people who have some weakness in the lower extremity, but they're still able to walk, or they have quite severe weakness, at least around one arm. The other inclusion criteria you may not be familiar with is the reachable workspace, because they put a reachable workspace area on here, and most people don't have this done, and they certainly wouldn't know what their numbers would be. But you can think of this in a fairly simple way. That scale that they have there is going to include most of you. It's people who have a little bit of limitation on how far they can reach their arms up. So they're not completely normal, but they're still able to move their arms a little. And that'll probably be most of the people uh, with FSHD. I want to switch gears now and talk about the other study that's set to, to start probably in the next few months. This is the myostatin inhibitor. There's been sort of a long history of myostatin inhibitor use in muscular dystrophies. If you think of myostatin, it's the body's break on muscle growth. We all have a process going on where we're damaging muscles and muscles are having to regrow. And if there was no break on it, the muscles would just keep growing. Indeed, there's some humans who are born who don't have myostatin. And you can see an example of a baby here. And you can see that even just after birth, that uh, quadriceps muscle is quite uh, pronounced. 
And in mice, you can take away myostatin, and what you develop is sort of a super mouse. You can see it on the right. It's a very muscular mouse. And so when we think about FSHD, there have been several studies that have already been completed. Some of you may have been in this first one. It was a WIAS study. It was a phase one, two study. So it meant it was really looking at dosing and safety and maybe preliminary evidence that the drug was having an effect that they would expect it to have. It wasn't limited to people with FSHD, but there were about 36 individuals with FSHD in this study. It was a systemic delivery, so it was given IV. In this study, it was generally safe, but they did have to stop it for the highest dose group, which was 30 milligrams per kilogram because they were having a type of allergic reaction to the medication. They were unable to see any difference in strength or function, and there was no difference in the muscle MRI volume, which is what we might have expected, but they did think they saw a trend towards an increase in lean muscle mass using a different technique called DEXA. What I'm showing you here in this picture, I just pulled out just the FSHD patients, and I'm showing you their combined measure of strength the dotted line here at zero would be people whose strength was just not changing over the course of the study. And I think you can see it here that as we move to the higher dose cohort, perhaps there's a trend towards improving strength in FSHD. And so this has led to the impression that this approach might actually be useful in FSHD. There was a more recent study some of you may know about or have been in of a different drug uh, by Acceleron. This is a folostatin analog. Again, it's the it's a body's enzyme that sort of battles myostatin, so it should improve muscle growth. It was directly injected either into the biceps or the tibialis anterior. Their primary readout was a biomarker. It was the change in muscle volume over six months. And what you can see on these graphs on the top two, this is the muscle volume. The dark line are people who got the drug. The dotted line were getting placebo. That dotted line down the middle is the end of the placebo controlled period. And I think you can see up is better that there's an increase in muscle volume in both the tibialis anterior and bicep. And it's pretty large somewhere between 12 and 15% increases in muscle volume with this drug. When the placebo patients switched over to getting the drug in the second half of the study, you can see their muscle volumes also went up. But these last two graphs below it are functional measures. On the left, a functional measure of your upper arms. On the right, a functional measure related to walking and I think you can see in both, there's no difference between the placebo or the treated group. And this is why the company stopped their development of this drug. But we learned a lesson here. And the lesson was because we had limited natural history data about how MRI muscle volume changes now would affect people down the road over a year or two years, it was difficult to interpret a study like this. And that was definitely a barrier to them moving on with development. So our current study that's set to start now in the next few months, the Roche study, this is an anti-myostatin drug. It's a monoclonal antibody. It binds latent myostatin. So that's myostatin right before it becomes active in the muscle. It's given subcutaneously every four weeks for a year. It will be randomized, placebo controlled. There'll be 48 individuals. Half will be getting drug, half will be getting placebo. The primary readout for this study is an MRI readout. So the change in the contractile muscle volume in your quadriceps, so in your thigh muscles. Um, when we look at their inclusion and exclusion criteria, they're also looking for adults, genetically confirmed individuals, but can have type one or type two FSHD. They need to be able to walk without assistance 
And on that clinical severity scale, if we interpreted that number for you, it would be people with some weakness in their legs, but that are still walking. I wanna switch gears now and talk about those RNA-based therapies, because these are the true gene-targeted therapies. And you've probably heard some of this terminology, antisense oligonucleotide therapy. It's called antisense because the script of the chemistry can actually match to RNA or even DNA in the cell. So it's specific. It can genetically find particular places in DNA or RNA, but these RNA therapeutics can really have a broad array of effects. Some of them can be more permanent. Some of them are less permanent. They can target a particular protein. This is the one that may be important for FSHD, targeting duct 4 and causing it to break down. But there's other things it can do. It can alter how the cell makes protein. So it can either alter splicing or cause the cell to skip expressed regions or intervening regions as they're making proteins. And that was what was used in SMA and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. For FSHD, the companies that are closest to clinical trials in Avidity, who has approval to do their first in human study, these companies are using a platform that's a really hybrid molecule. It has either an antibody or an antibody fragment that's linked to an RNA therapeutic. And the way to think about this is this antibody piece that I'm showing you here is like an address on an envelope. It's targeting something called the transferrin receptor, which is just a receptor that takes iron into the cells. The muscle has a lot of transferrin receptors because it needs a lot of iron. And so this is being added to help get the, the drug into the muscle. The yellow piece here is just a linker, and that red piece is the drug. It's that little piece of RNA. And in this case, that RNA targets that duct 4 mRNA directly and shuts it down. So this is a drug that gets in the muscle and then should shut down the duct 4 activity. The study that they're planning is what would be called a phase 1-2 study but they'll be looking at safety, dosing, and then they'll look for preliminary signs that the drug gets in the muscle and has the effect they want it to have. And they'll likely use changes on MRI to show that. Well, there's other types of companies that are out there that may be really interesting, but aren't coming for probably a little longer time. And I wanted just to talk about one that's a cell-based therapy. I think one of the questions I get most frequently is still about stem cell therapies. Um, and you may have seen the news that Solve FSHD, the head of Lulu Women started Solve FSHD to help promote drug development for FSHD. And one of the companies they funded was Vita Therapeutics. They have a kind of novel approach to developing stem cells and the main approach they're using now, it's individually unique. So each individual is sort of getting their own drug development process, but ultimately over time, they're going to try to make a more general stem cell. But in the individual approach, what they're going to do is take a sample from you. They're going to then take that blood and chemically alter it back until it becomes a cell like a stem cell that can become any, anything, they then will take those cells and perform gene editing on them to correct the genetic problem that causes FSHD. They'll then grow those cells out and then inject them back into your muscles. So it would require multiple injections into multiple muscles. And their hope is those cells then will regrow in the muscle and not have ducts for damaging that regrown muscle. In the general type of stem cell that they're hoping to make, the big difference here is that they're not correcting a problem specific to um, FSHD. Instead, they'll take healthy cells from people who are unaffected, grow them back into stem cells, 
they'll alter them so they don't elicit an immune response in individuals. They'll grow them out, and then they'll be able to inject those back into multiple people with FSHD, hopefully without an immune response. I just want to finish my talk talking a little bit on some of the work we're doing on the observational side. This is our clinical trial research network as it exists today. We've grown quickly from about four sites in 2016 to about 25 sites now. This has been sort of an act of love or the notion it takes a village to raise a trial. We're getting support from really everyone, from individual people, from industry who've been really fantastic partners in doing this, but they do get data back from us to help them plan for clinical trials from our foundation organizations and from the NIH. We have one study that's actively recruiting now that we call MOVE. This study has two parts. In one part, we're really just trying to follow people for longer periods of time to try to tie some of the tools that we measure things with to really hard outcomes in someone's life if they're needing to use orthotics or a cane or a walker so we can understand those relationships. But there's also a sub-study being done in this, and that sub-study came after the fulcrum phase two trial reached its end because we realized several companies were coming to us and saying, we need to know more about what whole body MRI does to people over time if you just don't even treat them. And we need to know more about how to interpret the biomarkers in the muscle, but also in the blood. And so this study was really started to help us get those questions and circle back to the companies to get them the data they need. I just want to end my talk with a slightly different question, which is, we have lots of studies available now. Some of them are clinical trials of drugs. Some of them are observational studies. How do you really decide what study to do? And I mean, the first thing I want to say is it is a personal question. So you and your family need to talk about it. What kind of study are you interested in? Some people are very interested in drug studies. There are other people who aren't ready for a drug study. And they're more interested in just helping us better understand FSHD. How much time do you have to participate in a visit? Remember, an early phase drug study is going to take a lot of your time. It may be a shorter study, but there'll be lots of visits whereas an observational study may only have a few visits over the course of several years. There are also other ways to participate that maybe don't require you coming in for visits. Participating in surveys are in some of our patient advisory groups. There's no right or wrong answers here, and your feelings clearly can change over time. When you think about the drug studies, and I often get this, how do I know which one to pick? Again, what I usually sit down with someone and talk about, I'll, I'll try to figure out by talking to them, is there a mechanism that makes the most sense to this person? You know, what appeals to their sense of what a good treatment would be? Is it the small molecule that may have a modest effect but has lots of safety data? Are they really wanting a higher risk, higher reward treatment that may have a really profound effect on their, their disease, and we try to get that fit right. Um, as a rule of thumb, as I mentioned, earlier phase studies likely are going to have more of your time with more measurements in them, but they're likely to be shorter studies. And then why do we need observational studies? I hope I'm making the argument for this in this talk, but we need it in the same way that we need the drug studies. It's our chance to go back and fill in the pieces of knowledge that we don't have and those pieces of knowledge that the next round of drug companies are likely going to need to be able to offer us well-planned and well-thought-out clinical trials. All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk to you and share this with you today. And I'm happy to take any uh, questions that people may have. Thank you so much. 
it's so exciting year over year to see the, the movement in this field. And we've really noticed it in the last just two or three years, just dramatic advances from one year to the next. So um, we're open for questions. You can post your questions in the Q&A section. I already see quite a few there, so we'll just dive right in. A um, couple people wanted to know why this age 65 cutoff for clinical trials. Yeah, and I again, it's it's one of these really difficult questions. You know, I can tell you why. It's most of these are earlier phase studies. They're picking that 65 cutoff because as we get above 65, there's age-related changes in performance that are very hard to interpret. Um, this doesn't mean that the drug wouldn't be available to people if they were over 65. The companies are doing it in these early phase studies to try to get cleaner data that they can interpret. Remember the inclusion criteria, it's a starting point. We're then going to, if the drug's doing what we think it does, we're going to make this assumption, this job, that it should be beneficial for everyone if it's working for the group that's in that study. But that's where it's coming from. All right. And but you don't have that restriction on the move study on the natural history study. Yeah, we don't have that that restriction in the natural history study. I think part of what we did with move is we wanted to include people who hadn't been included in prior studies. This includes people who are having trouble walking, people with FSHD type two, children, um, and people with all different functional levels. So um, there are a couple of questions that are asking really just um, how can you expect to measure change in a slow progressing condition like FSHD? And people were saying, you know, it took me three decades to get where, where I am. How can you expect to see a change in the time frame of a clinical trial? And wouldn't there have to be longer term follow up? Yeah, it's a very good question. And so what a lot of, co remember, companies in the very early phase studies, they're looking at safety and dosing. And so they don't necessarily need people to be clinically changing in those studies. As you get a little farther along, they are going to want to see a change. But this is where we start relying on some of the things that we're calling biomarkers. The biomarkers have the advantage of potentially showing a change in a shorter time frame potentially in a smaller number of people. Certainly there's now some evidence that we can use MRI in this way. We can select a group of muscles that may be more likely to show changes over a shorter time frame and use that as an early signal that hopefully then would give us confidence that those other things we're more concerned about, how you say you're doing and your ability to do functional tasks would improve if we continued that treatment for longer. But you're right, phase three studies do tend to be longer. They're either going to be longer duration or they're going to have to have larger numbers of people in them. The phase three fulcrum trial has 230 individuals in it to help give them enough power to see a small change. Mm -hmm. Isn't one of the hopes with something like the MOVE study or MOVE plus study is that you might identify a type of patient who might progress faster and might be um, a good candidate for clinical trial where you're trying to show an effect. Yeah, yeah you, you hit the ultimate battle between inclusion and exclusion. I mean, I think patients always tell me they want to be included in clinical trials but companies want to be able to show their drug has an effect. And so in order to do that, we may need to select for groups where that are more likely to show change over shorter time frames. This is only valid if we think that by selecting that group, we're still going to learn something that would be important for a general group of people with FSHD and not just specific for those individuals. But we are doing that. The purpose of the MOVE study is to allow the companies to have an educated way of making those selections because our concern would be that companies are making decisions about who they're including or not including without enough data to really know 
if, if it's a reasonable uh, assumption when they limit their population. Here's a question. Um, would we need to take a drug for the entire lifespan or is, are there drugs that would uh, you just take it for a shorter period of time, I guess, and it would be? This, this is going to get at this notion of risk and reward. So, you know, the truth is there are certain drugs you're going to have to take for your lifespan. So lesmopamod, which is in our phase three study, it has a fairly short uh, duration of action. It's working on an enzyme to inhibit the, the uh, conversion of duct spore into functional protein. And so the, um, the truth is you're going to have to take that forever if you want to take that drug. Now, on the plus side, it's easy to take. It's a pill, and it's been shown, at least so far, to be quite safe. Um, some other drugs that we're going to give are going to have much longer effects. And most of the gene therapies, these would be therapies that we might use a virus to deliver to all your muscle cells, they're likely to have a more permanent effect. The plus, because if, if it works, you're going to like that, that it has that permanent effect. But remember, there's an unknown risk that if it doesn't work or causes a problem, that problem is going to be there and we'll have to deal with it for a very long period of time. Well, good follow on question to that is uh, about uh, Scott Harper's work on gene therapies. Can you give us a guesstimate of how soon that might get to clinical trial? <laughs> um, I, what I would say is, I mean, I think Scott Harper's lab is doing um, very good work. They, they are working, I should just point out, on, on more than one approach for FSHD. They're looking at small molecules that might be beneficial for FSHD. They're looking at these, these gene-targeted therapies. I assume what you're, what you're probably referring to is their gene therapy that will be delivered by a viral vector and has a fairly permanent effect. They're close to being able to do this in humans. They're doing the toxicology studies now that would help enable that. They're getting the funds together to do it, but they want to be safe. And so I think they're doing a good job of making sure they think they've got enough safety information to justify doing that first study in people. <clears throat> the question regarding um drugs such as lesmapamod that inhibit DUX4 uh, and could potentially halt or slow prog progression, is there any chance that muscles could then regenerate as part of the process? Or would that kind of therapy need to be paired with something else that's a, more of a regenerative therapy? You, you, you've asked like, sort of like the million dollar question. I get this question a lot and I'm an optimist. So what I say is, because there's muscle that looks pretty good in most people that I see, even if the muscle's partially affected, my feeling is if we could really stop the molecular changes that are damaging the muscle, you likely have a good possibility to improve. Now, not all your muscles are gonna improve. If it's really damaged, it may not. Um, but I would hope that you won't just see a halting of progression that people will start to gain some function back. But you're right. I think in our minds, a lot of us are thinking in the end, we probably will be thinking about combination drugs, a drug to stop the disease progression on the molecular side, and perhaps a different class of drugs that helps with muscle regeneration or growth. Great. <clears throat> um, if one is currently or about to enroll in the REACH study, will one then be um, ineligible for future studies with, for example, these um, mRNA type drugs? Anti yeah. So it's going to depend a little on the type of drug and how permanent the effect. Because lesmopamod wears off, and it wears off over a period of time that isn't that long, um, most people who are in the, the REACH study or Redux or if they decided to enter one of the molecular therapies, they would likely be able to do it. They would likely have to come off of the drug, though, for anywhere between three to six months before they could screen for that next study. 
that'll be different. Each company will make their own determination around it. Even for uh, drugs like the avidity trial, where maybe it's a larger effect, a more molecular effect, because it has to be repeated, and in theory, it can wear off. Even those drugs possibly would allow you to enter another study down the road. But again, each company will make their determination about what they feel will be acceptable uh, for, for prior exposure to experimental drugs. Okay. Uh, so there's a question here about mRNA vaccines, which we've heard a lot about with COVID. Um, could those interact in some adverse way with any of these um, clinical trials, I guess, especially? Yeah, I mean, a, a, good, a very good question, because some of the technologies that are being used are, are similar, they're overlapping. Um, I, no is the answer. I mean, no one thinks that the current version of the COVID vaccine is going to have any effect on these treatments. What you will find, though, is they'll, they'll probably want you to either have had the vaccine or if you're getting the vaccine, not to be dosed with their drug in the short week or two before or after you're getting that vaccine. Um, most companies are allowing the vaccinations for COVID during their studies. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a question here about stem cell therapies. Uh, they had heard about myoblast transfers back in the 90s. How are the current stem cell therapies different from those types of therapies? So the myoblast transfers, and this was mainly in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the, you know, the, the myoblast transfers um, didn't, well, one, they didn't work. <laughs> two, two, there was a real problem because they were donor cells. And so there was an immune response to them that was being triggered in individuals. And so I don't know if those are the ideal comparison to what we'll have today. The current version of stem cells is quite a bit different. Um, the Vita that I mentioned, their current model is they're going to take cells from each individual, so that means it'll be your own cell. They then chemically alter them in the laboratory to make them recurse backwards in development to a stem cell. Um, this means that it gets a little bit beyond what a myoblast is. It goes to a slightly earlier state. They'll then maybe push it forward till it's more like a satellite cell. The risk was always that these cells would just grow out of control, but it turns out now that they've got enough laboratory control over these cells and where they're at, that they think the safety is there to start using them um, as sort of a surrogate for stem cells. Um, so, I mean, I think we're going to see this coming up. We're going to see more intelligent design and we're likely to see a combination of taking those cells and genetically altering them and then putting them back. So another step involved. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is this. I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but it's around expanded access. <laughs> um, and specifically for Los Mapa Mod, is there anything you can tell this group to help them understand what that is and how that works. So expanded access programs have been around for a long time. The FDA definitely has a pathway to allow for expanded access as well as compassionate use. Um, the, there are some rules around it. You can't, you can't create an expanded access program for a drug that would compete with an ongoing clinical trial. So they would have to choose people who couldn't enroll in their current clinical trial to get in the expanded access. The decision to make it is, is up to each company. Now, if you want a company to do it, you do have some say. You can reach out to the company and ask them if they'll do it. And uh, sometimes uh, a little public pressure, it goes a long way to getting a company to consider doing this. But remember, there are a lot of financial constraints as well. Some of these companies are quite small and, and running an expanded access program can be millions and millions of dollars. 
Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good question. What is the best way to get involved in a trial? Um, yeah, there are a lot of ways to get involved in a trial. I usually tell people if, you, if there is a center near you where they're doing research, start by reaching out to that center and talking to them about what the opportunities they have available. You can go to the FSH Society website and they often have a list of all the studies that are going on and you can get information from them as well. You can come to our PTRN website. We have people contact us directly. Um, we're always happy to, to help direct them. And I think we put a little toolkit together for people that uh, Friends of FSH had had posted um, that just gives you some tips about uh, getting involved in research. But the main thing is letting people know you want to be involved. Great. And then we have so many people from Europe wondering, well, they're asking, can they come to the U.S. to participate in a trial? But they're um, European sites, I'm right? I'm going to answer that because I do get a lot of people from other countries wanting to come here. It's up to the sponsor. And so if someone contacts me from Europe and asks me if they can be in our study, I usually ask the sponsor if they'll allow it. The other thing you need to know, though, is there are perhaps more barriers than most people realize, and it depends partially on the age of the subject, but you would likely have to relocate into the United States for the bulk of that study. And so it is a, a large commitment to do that. Um, it's very hard to commute back and forth from an, uh, another country uh, when you're in a trial. But there are sites in Europe that are participating. Yeah, there are sites in Europe. I, I, I advise you to look, check and see. Most of the studies going on now will have sites in Europe. Great. So we are at the end of our hour. I can't believe it. Um, and uh, But I do want to give, uh, I think Jamshid, my co colleague, our chief science officer, is on here. Is there anything? <laughs> No, thank you very much uh, for a very comprehensive overview, Dr. Statlin, of the landscape and the uh, progress being made. I think it's uh, everybody should feel uh, very hopeful about what the future holds and all the various trials and especially all the lessons we learn as uh, trials advance to the next stage. Uh, there's a lot of learning opportunities for the future trials to improve. So really wanted to thank you for um uh, explaining the whole uh, system and how it operates. Um, um, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you. It's a pleasure meeting yeah. people from all over the world. <laughs> I'll let right. Beth close out. Yes, honest. Um, that was honestly, Dr. Stalin, it was just really, uh, really like, Jam Sheet said was just an amazing overview. So thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for attending our FSHD University webinar today. Again, special thanks to Dr. Statlin. Great information, answering all of our crazy questions. We appreciate that very much. Um, our final FSHDU webinar for 2022 is coming up on December the 15th at the same time, one o'clock Eastern time. Our guest speaker is our very own June Kinoshita, who will speak about about getting trial ready. So, um, which you heard all about today, all the potential clinical trials coming down the pipeline. Now more than ever, it is critical that everyone in our community knows what they can do to be trial ready. So be sure to join us on December the 15th. Um, tonight at nine o'clock Eastern, join our radio show host, Tim Hollenbach on Facebook as he's gonna be talking with um, Lee Reynolds, our chief program strategist. And then speaking of Tim and the radio show, you're not going to want to miss our annual Radiothon on Giving Tuesday, which is November 29th. That's the Tuesday right after Thanksgiving. Tim is going to be hosting guests nonstop from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Facebook Live. Um, the guest lineup is absolutely incredible, uh, ranging from experts like Dr. Statland here is coming to join us um, to FSHD community leaders. Celebrities like Max Adler and Madison Ferris are going to be on, as well as representatives from several of the pharmaceutical companies that Dr. Statlin just spoke about today. So be sure to join us on Facebook Live November 29th for our Giving Tuesday Telethon. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today, and we will see you next time, December 15th, hopefully. Take care, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>